the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, Odd Messerschmitts, Challenge, Out of Sight Bombing, and Metal Beasts, How to Make an MBT the Israeli Way. Since we've already introduced the highlights of the new Israeli aircraft, it's now time to talk about ground vehicles. Please welcome the legendary main battle tank, the Merkava Modification 2D. This tank is now the top premium machine of the new nation. Let's take a closer look at it. Its main weapon is a two-plane stabilized 105mm gun with elevation angles between minus 8 and plus 20 degrees. The tank also has four machine guns and a number of smokescreen systems. The engine compartment is found in the front, next to the driver, and the rest of the crew is placed in the turret. The main ammo is stored in the hull rear and protected by armor plates, while the turret has additional defenses in the form of composite shields. Compared to other MBTs with a BR of 9.0, the Merkava is a pretty large and a very heavy tank. Despite its mass, its armor cannot provide a reliable level of protection against the APFSDS uh, the tank's opponents are usually equipped with. This tank's survivability has little to do with armor thickness. Instead, it's a few design solutions such as ample behind armor volume, a complex turret shape, multiple internal armor plates, and the engine placed in the front. Within skilled hands, the Merkava may absorb enemy rounds one after another and even stay combat worthy. And when you finally do need to retreat from the front lines, a smoke screen can help you hide your maneuvers. The tank has multiple smoke screen systems, turret-mounted grenade launchers, a mortar on the roof, and even ESS. Remember that the latter is transparent from the thermal imager. The Merkava's survivability allows it to push the front line on any map, forcing through enemy defenses. However, flanking attacks and rushing aren't the forte of this Israeli tank. The mobility is too modest for such maneuvers. Nevertheless, you won't notice a big impact of this floor in an open landscape. The Merkava feels amazing in long-range fights where the distance makes it hard for the enemy to get a good aim on its modules. The main shell here is the M111, the APFSDS type. It's perfectly capable of damaging most targets effectively. Only a few would need careful aiming for vulnerabilities. Finally, there's another strong side for the Merkava. It's machine guns. No less than four MGs can create an impenetrable shield against enemy ATGMs. The S-199 history started in Czechoslovakia, whose factories had many unfinished BF-109 planes left after the German occupation, mostly the G-5 and G-6 series. They were used to create some fighters for the nation's own air force, and since the original DB-605 engines were destroyed in a fire, they had to make do with the UMO-211. Frankly speaking, the decision was far from perfect, but nothing else could be done. A poor flight performance was <laughs> better than none. Moreover, the UMO-211 engine was made for bombers, and as such, there was no way to install an engine cannon. Even the synchronized cowl-mounted machine guns were unreliable, sometimes shooting off the propellers. As for cannons, the only ones they could have were in wing-mounted gun pods, which made the aerodynamics even worse and moved the center of mass forward. 
There was no way to squeeze them inside the wing, since it barely had any place for smaller calibers. Yeah, the S199 speed was almost 100 kph lower than the original BF109, and maneuverability suffered too. Yeah, it made the plane even harder to control on takeoff and landing than the original late 109s. But it was their own plane, their own and not imported from abroad, be it the West or the East. And it was an interim solution anyway, since the jet era was already knocking on the door. The Czechoslovakian engineers must have known that such a plane wouldn't last long in service. But what's next? Scrap them? Well, they're almost new. Sell them? Well, after the war, you would get wonderful, almost brand new Mustangs from the United States for a price comparable to a military truck. Just get it off their hands. And the Soviet Union was practically giving away its excellent Yak-9 and LA-7 aircraft to its allies as part of their help for friendly regime. So, who would ever need the obviously inauspicious S-199 in that world? Strange as it may seem, they did find a buyer. The new and aspiring nation of Israel, trying to survive in the challenging environment with the weapons embargo imposed on it. At the time, the Israeli army was trying to get any weapons they could, in any possible way, for any money. So Czechoslovakia couldn't miss the opportunity. It was a true mission impossible type of operation. One of the first brilliantly performed by the secret service of the young Israeli nation. 25 S-199 aircraft flew to Israel at night, only making stopovers for fuel and maintenance in places that asked no questions. We're still unsure what had Czechoslovakia hoped for when they sold the S-199, that no one would notice the fact, and the tiny group of 25 planes would just dissolve after a devastating attack of the Arab countries before someone realized some odd Messerschmitts were soaring above Sinai. Boy, were they wrong. In the hands of the Israeli pilots, the S-199 made a splash, and a grandiose scandal ensued. Many Czechoslovakian politicians and officers lost their careers, and even freedom. The odd Messerschmitts were fighting and winning, winning a right to exist for Israel. But, shall I say it, that's a story for another time. The direct hit update added some high-precision ordnance with TV and laser guidance systems. The new weaponry has already gained some fame in top-ranking battles, and today we'd like to talk about one particular bomb, the one with the longest range, the American AGM-62A. We'd like to attempt a new distance record in bombing and a hit a target from Ready? 25 kilometers! We'll definitely go for the Phantom as the carrier, since its speed will come in handy. First, we'd like to do it on a test range to see what difficulties we might expect. We gain around 7 kilometers of altitude, then add some speed, and find the target. As soon as the distance to the target drops down to 25 kilometers, drop! The bomb leaves the pylon and begins its first and last flight. Now, we need to wait a little. It'll take the bomb around one to one and a half minutes, so we'll speed it up for you. And it's done. We have a hit. All we need to do now is to try that in a random battle, we thought when we pressed to battle. But as it often happens with challenges, it takes quite a few failures first. We chose the HSTV-L light tank to score enough points for aircraft. It's cheaper than an MBT, and the scouting bonus is most welcome. As it turned out, getting the aircraft wasn't the hardest part. 
You need a lot of time to perform a successful bombing. But one of the teams would often steamroll the opponent, capture all the zones and advance the end of the battle. Also, we've encountered another difficulty in the first long battle we had, spotting targets at a long distance. Originally, we planned to drop our bombs into places with the high chance of enemy groups, <laughs> but it didn't work out. Fortunately, some friendly helicopter pilots helped us out with squad spotting. That made the task easier, but we still needed to make a successful hit. We wasted so many bombs trying to complete the challenge, but we never gave up and joined battle after battle. And here's our successful attempt on the field of Normandy. Scoring the points, taking the Phantom, and the first flight yeah, is a failure. All four bombs miss the enemy, so we scramble back to reload. Here's the new set. Speed up and climb. Then check the distance to the battlefield by strategic points markers. We're in position. Switching to aims, and send three bombs at the squad mate's mark some 25 kilometers away. After a whole minute and 35 seconds of waiting, the first bomb reaches his target and sends an enemy ZSU-57-2 to the hangar. Challenge completed. Phew. Now what frags have you been able to score with the new smart munitions? Share it in the comments. Come on, you guys. Meanwhile, we'd like to answer some of the questions you've asked in the previous episodes. The first question was sent by a player called Oren Averbuck. What's the difference between the BF-109 G6 and the G14? Hi Oren, the G14 is a bit lighter than its counterpart, which gives it more speed and climb rate. As for the looks, you can tell them apart by the cockpit canopy. The G14 has fewer metal bars. Talebowski asks, does the Abrams M1A2 have an early warning option for laser-guided missiles? Hi there, Talabovsky. Unfortunately, even the top Abrams has no such system. By the way, you can make a quick check if a tank has LWS. You just need to open the modifications window and find, eh, or not find, the module. Another question comes from Allo. 119. How to use the M163 tracking radar? Hi there. Just point your crosshair at the plane and press the target lock button. Done. Ada Kolb writes, what Spitfire has the most bombs? Hello, Ada Kolb. The Spitfire Mark 22, the Mark 24 can carry the most. Their max load is three 500 pound bombs. And the last comment for today was written by Mr. Shortyface Man. After you downloaded the skins from WT Live, how do I add it to my vehicle? Greetings, Mr. Shortyface Man. Just copy the folder you downloaded to use the skins, then open the game, go to Customization, and select the file you need in the User Skin drop down menu. Okay, guys, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern time. Subscribe and click the bell. Go on, do it. If you don't want to miss our next videos, and you really don't want to, don't forget to check your bomb fuses before a battle. Leave a like, because you really do like it, and share your thoughts and comments with us. And hopefully, we'll see you next week week.